thank you for coming. Today we have a great topic. Uh, it's even a topic, it's even a workshop on Unreal Engine. Uh, we have a great guy from Epic Games. Uh, he's showed. I hope I, I pronounced right. Almost. Awesome. Uh, so, guys, uh, I think we can start. And I give the award to Shout. Yep. Cool. Hi. Um, yeah, Unreal. How many of you have used Unreal? Okay. How many of you are using Unreal on a weekly basis or often, very often? Anyone? Yeah. Okay. How many of you use Unity on a weekly basis? Okay. <laughs> One love forever. Um, so I'm here for two hours. What I'm going to do over two hours, it's divided in two parts, is I'm going to build this, which you see here. It's a, you control a toy plane, it's a wooden plane, and you fly through a living room. And so we're going to build the entire living room from scratch and we're going to build the entire toy plane and the mechanic of that from scratch. That's two parts. Part one is blueprint and making functionality. Part two is doing the visuals and uh, lighting and the rendering and all those kind of things. Okay. Um, so that's my name. I'm Belgian, Dutch, live in Sweden. I'm an uh, evangelist for Epic Games. I've been using Unreal for 17 years now. So Unreal Engine 1, 2, 3 and now 4. And I travel around Europe, mostly Western and Northern Europe. This is the first time I got this far east in Europe, so first time here. And I talk about Unreal. I build things, I hold technical presentations, I do support uh, visits, those kind of things. Anything technical. I have a long technical background. I don't want to be a salesperson saying you have to use Unreal, the best thing ever. I'm just going to show it to you, you figure out, you know, make up your mind. It'll become obvious that it's cool, I think. Okay. Um, so I have about two, three thousand steps to go through. I'll do this relatively fast because I have to make sure it fits in the time. Um, this is probably too fast for you to follow every single detail. I mean, you're not going to remember everything. But the point of doing this is that you get an overview. You get a feeling for the entire process of building something in Unreal. Even if you don't remember every single step, at least you get a feeling for it, okay? So it feels less intimidating. You feel more familiar with all the steps and basically the workflow. Um, but because it's several thousand of steps, I might make a mistake somewhere along the line. So we'll just see how it goes. It's development, right? Something might go wrong. Probably shouldn't, but still. Good. So, as mentioned, we want to do a, a flying toy plane game from scratch. We're going to do the plane setup, checkpoint system. We're going to do the world building, lighting and rendering. We're going to do this using free Epic Unreal Engine 4 assets. And that will take us through blueprint, the material editor, level design, you know, foliage, lighting, if there is time left, probably not. We'll do a bit of sound as well, uh, maybe particles, etc. And at the end, again, if there is time left, we hope to have it packaged and ready for distribution. But that's not the most complicated step, so maybe I'll just explain it without showing it. It takes about 10 minutes to compile it, so good. So, part one, hour one. Um, we're going to do these things, and I'll just go through right away. Um, let's just get started. So, first things first, we need to make a new project. I'm gonna, we have a template system built in. Um, the template system, it's basically, you know, select what you want to have. If you want to have a top-down game, press the button and it will make a game. It's like click button, get game. It's very nice. It's very nice for learning because you can generate a game in either C++ or Blueprint. And you can see how it works out, right? You can see what's most essential to making a top-down game. So I would click that then generate it, then you can analyze what we have generated. Or it's good for prototyping, because you could just generate you know, a basic game and then prototype your mechanics on top, so you don't waste time setting up the basics. Uh, in our case, because I'm going to do it entirely from nothing, I will go for a blank project. It says here, you know, it's meant for desktop console, it's maximum quality, and it has starter content. You can change all of this, also C++, blueprint. all of it can be changed after you made the project. It's just how you want to start it. So that's the name, so just call it Minsk, and let's create that. So now we have ele elevator music. Mm -hmm. um, so once that's done loading, actually, let's just do this, we're going to use example content to speed it up a bit. So what we have, if you look here in the or launcher, 
So this is where you download Unreal from. It's just a launcher tool. But you have a Learn tab in there. And in the Learn tab, you got a lot of different, I mean, you can see here, for example, Level Design, a Quick Start, Artist Quick Start, Program, a Quick Start. This is where we have all the tutorials, all the documentation. It's linked from here to the websites we have. And beneath that, though, there is also stuff like Engine Feature Samples, which is all of this, and gameplay concepts, etc., and then games. There's about 26-ish uh, samples that we made. Some of them are entire small games, other than our uh, rendering examples, you know, things like uh, marketing uh, content we produce, like the boy and the kites that we released a year and a half ago. Let's see if, I, if the internet loads this. Um, all of that content has been released by us. So you can download it, you can look at how we made it, and you can use content from it in your own games. That's okay. Even if you're going to sell the game, that's okay. Okay. So the content we made is entirely available for you. And from some of this, for example, from the realistic rendering apartment here, that's the content I'm using. I changed a few things, I changed a couple of colors and all that, but you can also go home now, download this stuff, and do the same thing that I'm doing, except for the plane which we made custom, but I'm sure you can find a plane somewhere. Okay. Um, so in order to get that going, here's the editor, it loaded up our new project. For some reason, you, your starting scene is two chairs and a table with a piece of modern art on top. I never understood why, but that's now what you have. Um, but we don't have any real content in here, right? We have one package here called starter content. That's what I, that's an option that I enabled when I created the project. That's just a couple of things you get from us, but I mean, it's a couple of, you know, grass, stone, brick walls, random things that are probably useful, but it's not enough. So what I'm going to do is I prepared folders and I'm going to copy paste in these. And these folders are coming from these examples you can download, right? I just collected a couple of things that are useful from that. And I'll just bring them into my project that I just made. So, unlike certain other engines, um, the content in Unreal are individual files one by one. There is no meta files or anything else. It's just the files. Every fi every, everything you see in a content browser is a single file, right? If I click through this here, you can see it's a U asset file, and that's it. So if you have source control, you just send this file to, you know, to each other, submit it to source control, and so on. You can make these files read only. It, it just works. It's very straightforward. You can see by having copy pasted that in, I now got a lot more folders here, and you can see what it, uh, it added in. For example, here's the furniture from the room. Here is the. Let me find the couch. Here's the couch that we're bringing in later, etc. So we have that. Let's get started with the game. I'm going to create a new folder, call it Minsk as well. And I'm going to create two new blueprints. So blueprint one, and I'll explain more what blueprint is as we go through it, but blueprint one is a game mode. So FM game mode. BP, let's do that. My names are usually very bad. I have an artist background, so I make very bad names. And Blueprint 2 is going to be based on Palm. So what's happening here is that, first of all, in Unreal, we have a, a large game gameplay framework built in. So there's a certain way we prefer to do uh, very important classes like these. Rather than starting entirely from scratch, there is a certain amount of C++ in the engine by st standard which kind of wants you to follow our way of doing things. You can do it your own way, but it's just going to go a lot faster if you follow our setup. And our setup is that uh, everything is object. Underneath object, you have actor, which derives from object. And then pretty much everything in the world is an actor. Okay, this is a long list here, long hierarchy. But you can see pawn here might be hard to read for you, but pawn is underneath actor as well. The chair would be an actor, the sky. Basically, almost everything that's running in the game at runtime is derived from the class actor, okay? And one of those things that are, that's derived from it is something called a game mode, which is what I just made. And a game mode tells the engine which kind of default classes to use for other things. So what kind of player to use, what kind of player controller to use, what kind of HUD to use, and so on. So the game mode simply controls what are your other default standard classes. That's kind of just it. And that's what I just did. So I made one game mode, and I'm going to make one pawn. The pawn is the player itself or an enemy, but it's something that moves, something that walks or flies or, you know, um, called FM pawn. 
And in the game mode, if I double click that, it <coughs> on the this is blueprint. I'll get back to this later on. Right now, we're just interested in the properties here, where it says classes, and it says default pawn class. Well, I'm going to change that to the one I just made, which is called. I'm not sure what I call it anymore. You can always select it here, and once you have it selected, you press the arrow here, and it takes the current selection from the Compton browser. So now I assigned my pawn to the game mode. Okay, I'll just compile that, we'll save that, and if I now tell the game to use my game mode, because the game doesn't know yet, the engine doesn't know yet that this exists, so I'm just linking it all together here to prepare to, to start working. I'm going to go to project settings. And in, <coughs> in project settings, it says maps and modes. And it says default game mode. Okay, well, that's the one I just made. So that's that. And having done that, let's check if this is compiled. Having done that, and if I press play, you can see the game is now running. I can't do anything. I can't move. There is nothing I can do. But the game is running. If I regain mouse control for a second, let me turn on the sound. Uh, and look in the outline here on the right. You will see the yellow names, those are things that are spawned at runtime. So they're not part of the level, they are being spawned while the game is running. And you can see here, this is the game mode, FMG, GM, what I call it, GMBP. And here's FM Palm, that's these two. So they are running in the game. Okay, so it's using my stuff, so now we can start for real. Okay, so here's a pawn. Let's see what we can do with it. Um, let's add... Let's see what we can do. Maybe uh, let's add a mesh to it first. So let's add the model of the plane to it. I'm adding something called a static mesh to it. And a blueprint, it's both visual scripting, that's the biggest part of it really. You can see that's here, we'll do that later on. And it also have, has components. It's a little bit like a prefab, I guess. It holds both the components and the functionality. Okay, so you can attach sounds to it, particles, models, and so on. It's all of it at once. So I've added a static mesh to it, which is a model. And then here it says static mesh none, so there's nothing assigned, so you don't see anything. So if I now select toy plane, entity, the model component, basically, we see our plane. In fact, <coughs> I can move the plane, and let's just try to play and see what happens. And I might have moved the plane too much to the front or the back, I'm not sure, you should be able to should be looking that way. The problem is we don't have any control over the camera. So I don't really know where the camera is. I mean the camera is supposed to be on 000, which is there. And it's supposed to look X forward, which is there. So I'm supposedly able to see this, but apparently I'm not. And actually now you can, as you can see. If I get the window out of the way, it's right behind the... You can see the plane is there. So it's kind of running. But again, I don't have control over the camera, I can't move, it doesn't move forward either, and I can't rotate, I mean, you can't do anything, but it is doing something at least. So let's go back for a second, <coughs> and let's fix it up more. So the camera, if there is no camera here, which we didn't, then it will automatically take the middle of the world to center 000 as my camera. But if I add a camera to it, it will automatically detect the camera instead and use that. So for example, if I would want to have a top-down game, I could now do this, you know, turn the camera down, put it above the plane or something, play again, and you have a top-down game. So that's easy. Let's not do a top-down game though, so let's reset this for a second. Um, I'm going to leave the camera be in the, in the center of the world here. But the plane, instead of offsetting the plane like this, I'm going to bring back the plane to the middle and I'm going to add something called a spring arm to it. And then I'm going to make the static mesh component, the model of the plane, a child of the spring arm. So I'm going to drag it on top of spring arm and you can see it's now underneath. Okay. And because it's underneath, I can now use the spring arm to control it. You can see that there's a red line here now, it got offset to the back. That's because the spring arm, if I say minus 120, now it's in the front, um, it's offsetting. The spring arm is used for third-person cameras originally. I'm not going to do that, but I'm abusing it for something else. But imagine you have a third-person character, you want to offset the camera from the character, and then you want to do a line trace, ray trace from the camera to the character, so you understand when there's an object between the camera and the character and the, 
and the camera can try to work around that or adjust its position based on that, right? You also want to have lag. If you have a race game, for example, or in this case, a game with, a, with an airplane, you don't want the camera to be very rigidly attached to the car. I mean, that would be strange. When the car turns, you kind of want the camera to swing softly, right? It has to be a bit of lagging behind. And a spring arm automatically gives you all of that functionality. Except I'm not using it for the camera, I'm using it for the plane. So as I'm moving around, the plane is going to swing instead of the camera swinging. <coughs> now, here in the properties it says do collision test. I'm going to turn it off so there's no collision checking. We don't need that. And I'm going to say enable camera lag and then enable rotation lag. And I'm going to set the speed of the lag to 5, which is presumably a bit better. Still won't move. So let's fix the movement as well. There is a thing called um, simple uh, floating pond movement. And if I add a floating pond movement to the something that's a pawn or character class, it gives us basic uh, physics, basic movements, right? So here it says maximum speed. This allows me to move my pawn forward. We have two main classes, by the way. We have something called a pawn class, and then we have a character class. The character class is uh, derived from the pawn class. Character is used for anything that's more complex than uh, a pawn. So a human walking around is a character for us. It has way more options you get when you take that class. Uh, you know, you have jumping, running, um, you know, climbing ladders, swimming, all that is standard supported in a character class. But since I'm doing a plane, I'm using the much simpler pawn class, which basically only gives me a way of accelerating forwards with a certain speed. And that's good enough for the plane. So maximum speed, let's say it's 200, and I'll leave everything else as it is. <coughs> and if we now go to the visual scripting part, so I click on the event graph here, and I take, for example, event tick, which is update per frame. So for every frame, it will fire and it will update it. And I say, for example, add movement input. And uh, <coughs> world direction is 1. And scale value is 1, so that's good enough. So it will move in direction of x1. And it will do so with 1 times whatever speed I set in max speed. And we play that, we're probably going to fly backwards or so. So now we fly backwards, as you can see. But at least we're flying. I can't move still, I can't do anything, but we're getting somewhere, right? So let's see. Let's see what we can do here. So the flying backwards is a problem, and the fact that I can't steer the airplane is a problem. Uh, it doesn't really matter which one we do first. Let's do the steering, perhaps, because it's more fun to see how it's going to fail. It's going to go wrong because you fly backwards, but more entertaining. So the steering, what I want to do is I want to use the mouse, right? If you move the mouse, using the mouse, you can just steer the plane, depending on where you move the mouse to. Um, as with most keys and inputs methods, you can just look for mouse X or something here, and you'll find it, and you can use it. You could do that, and it's okay, but it's not the best way of doing it. For example, if you want to have spacebar, you could look for spacebar, and whenever you press spacebar, he will fire this. Could do it. But then you're hard coding the keys, and that's not very good long term. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the input system. I'll go to project settings, and in project settings it says input here. And in input you can basically bind a key or some, some kind of input button or device to a certain action. And the action is referred to in scripting, right? The action is referred to in either C++ or in Blueprint. Therefore, if you change the button itself, the action doesn't change. So your code always remains the same, even to the, the, the buttons that might be linked to it might be different. And that's the proper way of doing it. I'm going to use an axis mapping. Uh, you have an action and an axis mapping. The action is basically just an, a Boolean state. Press button. Is the button pressed or not? And the axis mapping is a continuous thing. So for example, the mouse, because it continuously shifts position a little bit, a joystick is an axis mapping, and so on. And I'm going to call this uh, mouse x minsk, for example, and let's add a second one and call it mouse y minsk. And I'm going to bind it. Here you, here you have all the buttons that we support. So we'll just look for mouse x here. So that's mouse x. And this is linked to mouse y. And then usually we set mouse y on scale of minus 1, so it's inverted up and down. Um, and having done that, just simply adding it there, going back to Blueprint, if I now right click here and I look for mouse x minsk, you can see I get the one I just made. 
So whatever I add there will show up in this list. And here's uh, mouse Y. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add controller pitch input. I think add controller uh, yaw input. Okay. So what's happening here is that I tell when you move the mouse, th this will fire when the mouse changes position. It's going to add something to the controller's pitch input. So it's going to add a pitch value up and down to the controller. And this is again part of our wider framework. Might be a little bit confusing in the beginning. You can do this also by hand. I mean, I could have just done, for example, set actor rotation or something, you know. And then, if you press the mouse down, you simply rotate the entire actor. And since the actor is targeting self, it means you're rotating the player because I'm in the player in the pawn. I could have done that, but that would have been way too manual. It's not using the power of Unreal. So I'm using the controller, and the controller is this invisible class that controls the pawn. We split it into two. In fact, if I look at the game mode, I'm not going to do this, but just to give you a, a feel for what we're doing, there's this class called a player controller class. That's your controller class. So what we normally do is we split the input part from the pawn, from the character, the player. It's two different things for us. Imagine that you have, for example, a game where the player can die. What, you know, any game almost, right? right? This, this came forward out of Unreal Tournament. You have an FPS player, the FPS player dies, and then a new player spawns, and you, as the person giving input, you get control over the new player, right? That means that the character died, but the player controller didn't die. If your input would have been linked to the one that would have died, you would have actually lost input over the keyboard entirely. So we're not doing that. Okay, that's a little bit, but it goes a bit advanced maybe for intro class. Either way, that controller class already exists anyway, even if I made it or not. And that's what I'm going to call on. So I'm going to tell that controller class, okay, hi, can you please use the value from the mouse for uh, adding a pitch and yaw rotation, basically. And then, <clears throat> in order to make the player also use the controller, the values from the controller all the way through, I have to do class defaults, and here it says use controller, pitch, yaw, and roll. So please just use the values from the controller. And that's it. I probably did these wrong, by the way. I usually flip them around, so I might get inverted mouse control, but we'll see. At least it will do something. You can see, I can now look around, and it's indeed inverted mouse, so I have no idea what I'm doing. But at least we can turn, and also the rotation, oh god. It doesn't follow the rotation still of where I'm looking, but at least we're doing something. So let's see if we can switch. I think it's probably more like this, I'm guessing. Start it again for a second. Okay, so this is correct. You can see I can now properly control where I'm looking. It's uh, not inverted, but we're still flying backwards and not following the rotation. That's, you know, the orientation of the plane. That is because world direction here is set to 1. And that's incorrect because it's not always the same direction, right? That world direction should be dependent on where am I looking. So what I will do then is, let's try this in a couple of different ways. Uh, get actor, I think it was rotation, not entirely sure anymore. Yeah, this is that. So I'm going to ask the rotation of the actor, of the player in other words. And then I will ask the forward vector, and the forward vector is the direction we want to move into. Try that again. Okay, and now I have this. So, yay. You can see that it's lags also, the plane doesn't rigidly stick to the camera. That is your spring arm in action, that lag. But it's still not very good because it's, I mean, it's when the plane turns, you kind of want it to like bang or roll over, right? And, and not just do this. Um, so it's still a bit, it still feels a bit rigid. It also doesn't have collision, as you can see. So let's fix the collision very quickly first and then move on to the, rota the, uh, to the rolling. I can add a uh, sphere collision to it. In fact, I can make the sphere collision the top level by dragging it on the, on the root component. It becomes a new root component. It becomes now the parent of the entire thing. See, everything is now attached to it. So I can collapse it there. And in sphere, I can now say, okay, sphere radius is, let's say, 8. It is right in front of the camera. It doesn't have to be very big, maybe even four. Looks very small, but when you're playing, because the collision is right in front of you, that's actually relatively big. Um, and it has collision settings. It says here collision presets. 
So let's say that this is uh, not overlap all dynamic because then it wouldn't collide with anything. But let's say it's custom. So I can control all of these flags myself and I'm going to say, well, it should probably block um, everything. But you are object type uh, pawn. Okay, so we have different channels, collision channels. So you can shoot things from, uh, from certain things. You can say, for example, the player doesn't collide with this tree, but everything else does. So you can have different uh, collision setups. So that should do for that. And then we have the rolling. So for the rolling, what I could do is I could say, okay, can you give me the mouse X uh, values, right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to detect how much I'm moving the mouse. If I'm moving the mouse a lot to the right, that means that the plane has to rotate that way. If I move it a lot to the left, it has to rotate that way, right? So I can read the value of the mouse and then convert that number to a rotation value that I will put onto the plane. Um, <clears throat> and the nice thing with Blueprint, actually, is that when you need to know a certain number or you need to know what it's doing, while the game is running, you can see Blueprint execute. In fact, I can read the numbers from it. See, now it says uh, input access mouse x uh, Minsk. It's currently zero, right? This might be hard to do on a small screen, but if I put this next to the game, control the game again, you can see it's very small probably to read, but that number is changing as I move the mouse left and right now. If I move it left, it will go negative. If I move it right, it will go positive. It will go around a value of one if I move it right, minus one if I move it left. So I know that that's the values I'm getting. That means that if this is 1 right now, I can multiply that by 90. So I get 90 degrees if I move the mouse to the right, 90 if I, minus 90 if I move it to the left. And then, because it's, it could actually go over the value of 1 or below minus 1, I'm going to clamp it so I'm certain that it never goes beneath minus 90 or plus 90. Just make sure the rotation doesn't go entirely insane when it attacks that. And then I can take the plane. So I'm dragging in the static mesh here. This thing now represents the model of the plane. And the thing with Blueprint also is that it's context sensitive, by the way. So that's why I dragged this in first. Look, if I right click, the menu I'm getting here is pretty long and is entirely different than the menu I would get from, for example, let's just see if I can find something from doing that. See, that's much shorter. So where you start dragging from, you will get a different kind of menu. You only get to see the options you can do on the thing you started to drag from. And you often get completely different options. There are options in here that I wouldn't be able to find in this menu. So for that reason, make sure you start with the thing you actually want to modify. So here I'm going to do set uh, component rotation or set, what is it? just do set rotation, set relative rotation. And it's going to look very weird, but let's just do it anyway. It asks for the rotation, but I can split the rotation into the three different values separately. So I have three different flows. And you can say, um, what are we doing here? The roll takes over the position from the mouse. And this is going to be terrible, but it's going to be entertaining. Let's do this. Yeah. So it's slightly sensitive, but I mean, technically it works, right? You can see it's, it will shift. Now I'm going left and then... But it's a little, little bit sensitive. Because <laughs> it takes every minute that the tiniest change will translate to the rotation of the plane. So instead of taking every single update from the mouse, I'm going to smooth it out. So I take more, you know, it takes a smoother result from it. And I can do that using an F interp. So interpolate the number from value A to value B continuously, so it's not so so twitchy or whatever. And it needs the current value. So the current value is the relative rotation as it is. So I'm going to ask the relative rotation of get okay, relative rotation. We split this up again, so we have the three different numbers. And I'm going to say, what is your current roll value? Okay, Your target is this one, because that's where we want to interpolate to. Your delta time is actually the world uh, delta time. That's this one. I could draw a long line or I can just find it again because it's actually just a different input here as well. This is the same as that. It's just so you don't have a, a long line making it messy. And interpolation speed is how quickly it blends from A to B. So let's say I think 2 or something. And let's try that again. Okay, so now that. That's much better. See, it blends in and it blends out. 
and it has collision. But the collision is on the camera, of course, so the plane is through the ground, but the camera isn't allowed to pass through the ground right now. So that works as well. You could, I mean, if I have more time, I could make the player explode, for example, when you hit the ground and then respawn and all those kind of things. But yeah, now we have this. Okay. Um, cool. Then we need checkpoints. So the game we are going to build is very, very simple. It's basically just fly around. You have X number of checkpoints and you need to go through the checkpoints in a certain order. And if you go through all of the checkpoints, you're done. That's it. Very, very simple. Now, to build a checkpoint system, I'm going to create yet another new blueprint. And this one is going to be based on actor. So in this case, I'm going to build something that doesn't have any functionality prepared for it in the engine itself. There's nothing in C++ that was prepared for a checkpoint. So I'm going to simply take actor, which is my neutral parent class. You know, if you don't know, if you don't have any functionality you want to build on, just use actor. So fm checkpoint um, bp from blueprint. Now we have an entirely neutral class. There's nothing here. This is just a placeholder sphere. It doesn't do anything. It's just almost like an icon. There's no real properties. These are the default options you get. You get default replication, by the way, if you don't want to do multiplayer games. It's already there. It's part of the standard package, but that's about it. So first things first, let's add a collision to it again. You can see if the sphere, the collision sphere, got added beneath the false scene root. I don't want this default scene root, which is actually that, that uh, white ball. So I'll drag this on top, and that removes the default scene root. Now I only have the collision. That's cool. And then I'm going to say that the collision, collision presets again. Let's say custom again, so I can control it a bit. And I'm going to ignore everything, but I'm going to be checking overlap for pawn. In other words, I'm making a trigger. If every, nothing will hit this except for the player, which can fly through as well, but he will detect when the player overlaps uh, this sphere. And when it does, it's going to send out an event, and we can, you know, we have a trigger basically. Uh, next up, I'm going to add a static mesh. Because similar to what we've done earlier, actually I'm going to set a collision to no collision, otherwise we're going to get stuck on the, on the checkpoint mesh, which would be kind of strange. And I assign a model called static uh, checkpoint. It's just a ring. I can see the trigger. Maybe we can make the trigger a little bit bigger. So it's a bit easier to get the checkpoint. And that's that. Um, we can also add a rotating movement component to it, which will make it rotate all the time. It, in fact, does rotation rate 180 on Z, meaning it's going to rotate 180 degrees every second. And that's fine. Um, and then you want to make sure, in fact, let me just add this to the world for a second, so you can see what it does in-game. You can simply drag this in, and we have a little blueprint checkpoint in here, as you can see. Let's place it in front of me somewhere, and let's place two of them for a second. Play, and you can see they're rotating. Kind of works, but it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't do anything more. We haven't done any functionality, but at least we have some form of checkpoint. So now I can right-click the sphere, which is actually my trigger. So right-click that, and I can do add event on component begin overlap. When something overlaps with this component, which automatically takes me to the event graph, and I get this event. So when it triggers the sphere, I can do something. For example, I can do the most simplest thing possible. I can do set actor hidden in game. When you trigger the sphere, hide the entire thing. So the checkpoint becomes invisible. And you can see that works. I fly through. If I try to circle around for a second, you can see there's no more checkpoints. Um, let's do some other stuff. I don't have sound here, but just for the sake of, of showing this. Play sound at location, for example, and let's do spawn emitter at location. Right. So when you trigger it, you're going to play a sound, and then you're going to spawn a particle, and then you still hide yourself. The location to spawn this at is the location of the checkpoint. So I'm going to do get actor location because actor location will ask location of self and I'm in the checkpoint. In other words, get location of your own checkpoint, of this particular checkpoint. And where that one is located, play the sound, spawn this particle. Sound is, um, well, you won't hear it anyway, so just pick something, gold pickup. And the particle is, um, I think it was called or something, old appearance, or appearance. Let me double check that. 
So very briefly, here's our built-in particle editor. This is the particle we're going to be playing and that's cool. So it's that, save and let's just try this. So that's going to work. You can see that because the particle happens behind you, you don't see it very obviously, but it's spawning the particle and if you would have sound, you would hear the sound. So that works. But obviously it doesn't check how many checkpoints have you used, you know, it doesn't check are you doing it in the right order. Um, the placement of the, the checkpoints isn't very good either. I mean, I don't want to have to place these one by one, so I want a way of automatically placing checkpoints for me. I want to draw a pot and on that path the editor should automatically place the checkpoints evenly spaced out. That's what I really want to do. So I have those three main issues. I also want to use some C++ and blend that with my blueprints. So I want to do all of that in the next uh, 20 minutes. Okay, so first of all, we have to track which checkpoint have you used and what's the current number of checkpoints. I mean, what's your position, right? You're currently at checkpoint number four, for example. We have to track the number somewhere. I could track the number in the checkpoint itself, but that would be bad because I might have 30 checkpoints. I don't want all 30 checkpoints to track the same value, right? So that's not an option. So we could do it in the player. So let's go to the player for a second. Where am I? Um, I could track it here because there's only one player, but that's still not really good. You know, if you want to do this correctly, that's not the best way to go because again, the player could get destroyed. If I would keep working on this game and the player would get destroyed because, for example, you crash onto the ground, then the player would have to respawn. But when you respawn, it will have lost the value that it remembered because the original player got destroyed, including its values. So you don't want to store this information in the player either. You want to store it somewhere independently. And one of the things we have for that is something called a game state. So there's a class called game state. So called FM game state blueprint. And again, because this is one of those really important, you know, overspanning classes, I'm going to have to open up the game mode. And in the game mode, it says game state class. So we have to again link it to the game mode. So let me link it. So there we are. It links over there to that. And here we have the game state. <laughs> One second, I have to drink. <laughs> Okay, so the game state, it doesn't really, I mean, you can't see anything in it. You can never see the game state. It exists in the world, but it only exists to hold information or run functions. So I can make a new variable here called uh, current uh, position BP. So this is the position, the checkpoint position I have right now. And you can see it made it as a Boolean, but you can change the type from a Boolean to, say, an int. And now you have your position. So this is the position we want to change every time. I could sh do that changing in again the checkpoint, but it wouldn't be very efficient. It's not very clean. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell the game state to update the position instead. The logic of updating the position will be entirely in the game state. The checkpoint won't do much, but, but trigger that functionality, trigger the function. So I can drag that in and then I get two options to get or to set a variable. In this case, let's just get it for a second. We can set it as well. Actually, it doesn't matter. But this is now our variable, right? And I want to have something that triggers it. So let's do a custom event. Add a custom event and then you can name it something. For example, increase score BP. And every time that it's run, it's going to do current position plus one. So integer plus integer plus one. And the result becomes the position again. So it will run this every time it's run. I could also do this as a function, by the way. A custom event or a function is almost the same. In fact, you know, I can just select these and I could always just right click. It's loading right click and I can always do collapse to function. And now I have a function, I double click that, you get the same here. I mean, it's, I'm gonna stick to a custom event, but it's very easy to make your own function. And purely for what we're doing, the difference is almost non-existent. Okay, they will both behave exactly the same in this case. We just copy paste this back and we're back to where we were. Okay, that's cool. What I then need to do is I need to get the checkpoint to talk to this blueprint. So I need to get one blueprint to talk to this blueprint. Okay, so in this, in the checkpoint, I'm going to say, okay, so when you get triggered, before you hide yourself, um, and actually let's just move all of this to the back. Let's do this first. At the very beginning, 
we first of all need a bit of security here. I'm going to add something called a do once. So only make sure you trigger yourself once. So okay, we can't just fly through the checkpoint over and over again even if it's invisible. And then I'm going to ask for the get game state. So here's my game state. But the problem is the engine doesn't know what game state it is. It just knows it's a game state. Okay, I can also do this for example, get player pawn. So here's the player. But again, you wouldn't know what kind of player it is. So I have to tell the engine, please interpret this particular thing as this game state. Right? Imagine you have a, a game with, for example, 10 player class, like let's say Team Fortress 2 or something. Then you wouldn't be able to say just get player because you wouldn't know which player class it is, right? Is it the medic or, you know, what, what are we dealing with here? Uh, so you have to cost, cost to your class. And if I do that, then I get access to what's in it. In fact, you remember I made a variable, it was called current position. If I try to find current position here, you can see it doesn't find anything. But once I've casted it, and I try to find current position, then I can reach my functions and variables within that blueprint. Likewise for the event I made, which was called increase score blueprint. Now we've done that. In fact, this is linked. I double click that. I automatically go here. So that is working. Um, what we can do, we could just for the time being, for example, do print string, I guess. Oh, that actually doesn't help. Let's put a print string in game state here. So every time it runs, just for the sake of testing, we can see what hap has happened. And the value that it uh, sets it to will be printed. So let's just try this. <coughs> it's very small to read for you probably, but it says one, two, very small blue font on the top left. In fact, you can always look at the output log, which is probably the same tiny size, but here it says in very small font, one, two as well. So in any case, it set the right value. That's the most important part. Um, but it still doesn't know the position, right? I could have just flown and to this one first and then do that one. I want to have them in the exact right order. So next thing up is I'm going to say, um, I'm going to set a, a number to it. So here's my checkpoint again. I'm going to add a variable to the checkpoint. I'm going to say position pp. <laughs> it's again an integer. And this number is now going to represent the position it has. I want to be able to expose that number to the level editor. So if I press that little yellow I here, it becomes a public variable. See, now it's yellow there. And having done that, going back to the editor here, if I select one of my checkpoints, then on the right side here, again, it's a small font for you probably, but on the right side, in fact, let me just I can get a zooming tool going. I remember what button zoom was. I think F9. It says here position BP, right? On the right. That's now my variable. So I can now set the, the number myself. You can see that's number one and your number two. That's nice, but nothing in the script is checking the values. So that's the next step. Um, before we trigger, before we increase the score, I'm first going to do a security check and I'm going to first check, okay, well, but it's the position I have is that the next one in line for the position that you, I mean, for the number of checkpoints you have, right? So if you are at checkpoint position number four, then only the checkpoint with number five can be triggered next. So he has to check, is this one higher than the position that he remembers? So that's what I'm gonna do first. Um, so that was called current position, get current position blueprint there. And this, this is supposed to be equal to the current position plus one. And if it's equal, then it means that this is the next in line and this is allowed to be triggered. Now, we don't want to do this after do once because that means that you can only do this check once. That wouldn't be good. So I want to have this functionality before do once. And once this is verified that this is the correct thing to do, then we can you know, have to do once or technically you can probably remove the do once because he can't pass this check any, for a second time anymore, any, anyway anymore, but whatever. We'll keep it simpler. So I'm gonna add this in front actually, it might be a little bit better. Take these two things, put them here. Then we do this check, we have a branch, so just a true and false comparison. And we can check, okay, so are you, um, 
are you indeed equal to the current position plus one? If true, then beco it becomes due once, and then it will still increase the score and do everything it did before. If not, it will not trigger. Let's see if this works. Let's place a third one. In fact, let's set the first one to value 2 and the next one to position 1. So it's the other way around. So now it's 2, 1, 3. Let's play that. So the first one should not trigger. And it didn't. I get, didn't get the small blue text and it didn't hide either. The third one shouldn't trigger. Let's try to get the middle one now. But that one triggered. Now that one triggers. And this one triggers. So I have the order going. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so let me do the placement. I'm going to do the placement blueprint first because that's uh, the easiest to do and then I can just show you the whole thing. And once I'm done with that, I'm going to convert some of this to C++ and merge that C++ with what I had. That will take up about all the time you have left and then I'll move on to building the level. So, placement script. Again, I don't want to place them one by one, so I'm going to create a new blueprint. And new blueprints again based on actor. And it's going to call FM placement checkpoint or checkpoint placement. Let's do it the other way around. Checkpoint placement BP. And in there, we don't do much. We only really add a spline. So we're adding a spline component to it, which in this case is just a line. That's fine. We'll deal with that later on. And then we'll immediately go to the scripting. But instead of using the event graph, I'm going to use the construction script. So it's actually this third step we haven't used before. The construction script is like an initiation script. Like it's what runs while the game is loading or what runs when the actor has first entered the world. So when the actor spawns, it first runs construction script and then it runs event graph. Event graph is run at real runtime. So as the game is running, it will continuously execute and, and check event graph, but it will only ever run construction script once when the whole thing starts. And that's good enough here because we want this to prepare something, right? We don't need the checkpoint positions to be handled as the game is running. We just need it to do it once when the game starts. So, meaning, I'm going to get the spline. In fact, I'm going to actually first do something else. Uh, do, if I can remember what it is, not that. <coughs> this one I usually forget for loop, I think, no. Just, I think it's for loop, and let me just verify my own pictures. So you don't do this uh, if it's for loop. So we're going to repeat this. I say, when it starts, you're going to loop this around this many times. The first index, you're going to start at position one, zero. And the number of times you want to loop it is the number of checkpoints you want to have. So I add a variable here, too. And the variable is called a number of checkpoints you want or so. It's so again integer. We'll drag it in here. We'll make it public so it's exposed in the editor, so I can set it in the level editor. And that's the last index. Okay, that's it. So this is how many times we want to do this. So every time he's going to loop it, he will fire this. And when he fires that, I'm going to take the spline, and I'm going to say, let's see what we want to do. Um, so the spline has a certain length. Let's say the spline is 100 units long. We want to divide that 100 units in the number of checkpoints we want to have. So if you want to have four checkpoints, that means we want to the, the divide the spline in sections of 25, right? Something like that. So I will do that divided. I'm sorry, get spline length. So get the length of the spline uh, divided by the number of checkpoints we want. So we get this uh, right calculation. And then we want to multiply this by the number, the position you're at. So if you're at the third checkpoint, that means it has to do 3 times 25, so you get position 75, which is correct, because now we have a checkpoint placed at 75% of the spline out of the four checkpoints we, we, we have in total. So multiplied by the index. In fact, the index is, I think, plus 1, because the index starts counting at 0. So we don't want to multiply by zero for the first one. So I'll just do plus one. Should be correct. Um, and then that's the position we want to figure out on the spline. So I get the spline again here. I'm going to say get the distance along spline, I think it's called. Let's see if I can remember. Get distance along spline. No, that was the wrong one, sorry. Again, distance. There's a couple of them. 
vielleicht in der Distance. Uh, I can't find the right name again. Let me just look at my own picture what the right name was. Get transform distance, okay. Okay, well that one. So get transform at distance along spline. And that says the distance, so that's the value we calculated there, the rest is correct. And then now we know in where in the world it's supposed to spawn. This is the transform value, right? So what I can do then is I can add a child component to it, chat add child actor component. It asks for the transform to spawn it at or to add it at. That's the transform we calculated. That comes from here. And uh, the component we're adding is the checkpoint itself. It's loading. It's not a bug feature. Um, so that's the checkpoint. Let me select it there and assign it here. And then the one thing we have left to do here is we have to make sure that the position, this value here, position gets automatically correctly set by the checkpoint placement, which it doesn't right now. So I'm going to have to ask, can you give me the actual actor? That's get child actor. So get, give me the one that you actually added. And of the one that you actually added, you can see it's an actor reference, so it doesn't know what it is. So I'm get, again, I'm going to do cost two, fm checkpoint bp, cost to my class, so I get access to what's in it, and then I can set current, or what is set position? I think it was called set position blueprint. Then I can set the position, just so each and every one of them get the correct position set. And the position is, um, I think, the same as this, right? Yeah, the number or the, the loop index you're at right now plus one because we don't want to have index uh, zero, so we always do plus one. So that's actually the same as that. And that should do. Let's try this. Let me delete these for a second so I don't get confused. And let's drag in that. You can see, I can say a number of checkpoints, four, I get four of them. So I get how many I, I want to have. And you can see there's a spline here. This is the spline I made in the beginning. I can actually move that. Right, so I can do that and I can right click the line and say add a spline point here. You can drag that up and it automatically does this. You have 20, you now you have that, etc. So that stuff just works. In fact, you can rotate it that way. Just add a few more points here. Because it nicely evenly spreads it out. This is a very terrible path to fly through, I think, but whatever. <laughs> you get the idea. <laughs> now they're all rotating. I could have fixed the rotation as well, but the order should be correct. You can see I can do that, but I can't skip part of it because these don't trigger. So the order also correctly works. I have to do it in the right order. So, yeah. Um, one very last quick thing before I do C++, just to make sure this is uh, correct. So what you actually want to do also is you want to do on begin play. When the game starts, in the game state, he's going to do get all actors of class. He's going to look for all, I was mistyped, get all the checkpoints. And that is this. And of all the checkpoints, he's going to do length. So tell me how many checkpoints you find in the world. And that is going to be remembered to checkpoints in the world BP. So that's everything that's in the world. The, number, the maximum number of checkpoints. Because I can't know when I'm winning, right? I need to know when to win. When you reach the last checkpoint. But how do I know it's the last checkpoint? So I first count all the checkpoints in the world. And if the position here is equal to the maximum that he found there, it means you got to the last checkpoint. So every time you trigger this thing, he is going to check your current position, and then he's going to check if that is equal to the maximum that he found when he did this count in the beginning of the game. So on begin play, when the game started, he will count it, and then every time he does a checkpoint, he will check if your current position is equal yet to the final one. If it is, then we can do, for example, console command. 
and the console command could be restart level, I think the command was. So we simply restart the level if you've completed it. But at least we have a winning condition now. Let me very quickly verify that. Yeah, and he restarted it. There was a bit of lag there from loading it, but you can see that works. So we have a winning condition, although it's extremely simple. Good. Do you want to replace some of this with C++? See how that goes. Um, adding C++ is very straightforward. We use Visual Studio, so you can simply do new C++ class. You get this little, uh, you know, wizard thing. Um, you can just do show all classes again. It's the same setup as before. So in this case, let's look for a game state. So here's the game states. I think, let me check. Here's a code, by the way, that I'm going to be adding. So I won't type this, I'll just uh, bring it in. We're going to do two classes. We're going to do the game state or self in C++ and we'll make the checkpoint in C++ and then we'll merge that with blueprints. But time is running out a little bit, so we'll see. It's going to go very straightforward to get things into Blueprint. Let me find the, the best example here. You know, the only thing you have to do to get a variable or a function to show up in Blueprint is basically just call it Blueprint Callable. And that will add it immediately to Blueprint. It's very easy to extend it. It's very easy to go back and forth from C++ to Blueprint and combine it in any way possible. When I did my own game, I did 80% uh, in Blueprint. That's a lot. Epic usually interni internally does like 20% in Blueprint, 80% in C++. But you can combine it very freely. 90% of the things you want to do can work, can be done in either Blueprint or C++. It's just what you prefer. And it's a little bit about performance as well, but only in extreme cases. For a game like this, you'll never notice a difference in performance, obviously. Um, so where are we? I'm going to do a checkpoint first, that was it. Uh, checkpoint, uh, so the game state. So I'll do a game state. I didn't need a name, so I think it was FM basic game state. Let me just verify the name with what I had. Or oh, FM base game state indeed. Let me just copy paste to be safe. And that's there, so let's create that. First time you do this, it has to generate a couple of these files, so that takes a few minutes possibly. After that, it's a lot faster. While it does these things, do you have any questions? Anyone? Yes. No. Uh, wait a second. Thank you. Uh, actually, obviously, this uh, blueprint um, setup generates some kind of a code. Mm -hmm. yeah? And so my question is uh, how optimal it is. Uh, uh, is there any um, need to a technical artist or a programmer to uh, look through it and optimize it in order to improve the performance? Um, yeah, probably is. I mean, it depends what you do, but you know, I'm doing this uh, per, per frame updating. Obviously, you don't want to have an artist that's going to do everything in the entire game updating per frame, which they probably will. So yeah, you will always need someone who's going to review it. It's a little bit of the discussion, right? Like, how much power do you want to give to the artists and how much do you, do you want them to mess it up? Which they will. But I think it's better to train them, even if you have some problems maybe in the beginning where the artists or the designers or so go way too far or you know, they do things in the wrong way. I think in the long run, if you get the communication going between you and you, you, add, you know, help them a little bit more, explaining them how to best do things, in the long run it's a lot better and it will empower the team. So in the beginning you might have to do a few more reviews than normal, a few more discussions back and forth like please don't do this, don't do that and pay attention to that, but in the end you should be better off. Uh, well, I mean, uh, are there any nodes in, in these blueprints that uh, are obviously not uh, as optimal as uh, like just uh, lines of code? Um, both, both in cleanliness, yeah. I mean, I tried to do an inventory system, for example, you get a massive spaghetti thing. Obviously, you can try to clean it up a bit, but you reach a point where the complexity might be better handled in code, in, in, in many different cases, yes. So A, that, and B, performance-wise, things like tracing, maybe I used to do in uh, C++. Like, if I have lots and lots of traces going out in all directions, doing lots and lots of checks per frame, like the, the heavy things, that I would push to code. I mean, well, if uh, we uh, may summarize this, uh, then writing code like by hand is uh, always more optimal than blueprints. It is. But you reach a point where you maybe don't need all that extra performance anymore. 
your bottleneck is often the graphics anyway, right? The GPU is, is the one that's holding it back. So you have usually quite a lot of uh, CPU to spare. So there's that. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Hi. I have a question about uh, Blueprint format. Uh, let's say we, ha we have uh, several designers working uh, with a uh, single Blueprint. Mm -hmm. And using a source version control like Git or Mercurial, we need to merge these files together. So mm -hmm. the, if there are any problems, if they collide with the same object. Uh, we have a built-in Blueprint merge tool. And um, you know, it will give you a visual, visual diffing between the two versions of the Blueprint you have. And you can actually see these nodes and these, you know, this is what changed in there. So you can merge them with your own tool. But it's not what I would say is the best day-to-day -day workflow. What I would do is try to avoid those situations in the first place. It's different from, you know, it's, it's still a little bit, it's not ideal. So we have a lot of tools built in. I can't show all of them right now, but for example, you can do, I did a child component, for example, child actor. So you could have basically one blueprint that's a child component of another blueprint. You could have a function, you can have the functions saved in other blueprints, right? So the functions are here, this, but this blueprint uses the functions from this class over there. Basically, the point is you can split it up and distribute your functionality in a lot of different ways in blueprint as well. You don't have to put everything in one giant player blueprint, for example, and then having to merge it over and over again. Basically, I would find a way of organizing it so you don't have to merge so extensively. You understand? With all the tools we have built in. So it's much more distributed, so you have less chance of people working and messing with the same scripts at the same time. That's by far the best way of doing it. Only use diffing for emergencies or if you really have to. That's what I personally would do.